as you know, today we are going to concentrate on these eight verses of mind training. Uh, in Tibetan, mind training is called Lojong. Uh, but although it says mind training, it's really more attitude training. It's not a mental exercise. It's about how to transform our habitual, rather negative responses, especially when things go badly, into something much more positive. And in other words, how to take difficulties uh, onto our spiritual path, rather than seeing difficulties, difficult situations, difficult people especially, as somehow an obstacle to our practice we can recognize that in many ways they're a very essential component of our practice. If we only practice when everything is nice and people are friendly, then that's not really practice. So this, this way of taking difficult circumstances, difficult people, and using them as our spiritual practice was uh, particularly introduced into uh, Tibet during the 11th century by a great Bengali um, scholar practitioner called Depankara Atisha. And uh, he actually was now, I think he was born in Chittagong, so he's actually Bangladeshi. But of course in those days that was Bengal. And he studied for many, many years in uh, not only in India, in the great uh, Buddhist universities of those days, such as Nalanda and Vikramashila, but also he spent many, many years, 12 years, 15 years, in Sumatra, in Indonesia. And it's there that he uh, studied these uh, mind training teachings. Then he came back and uh, he was invited to Tibet but he didn't really want to go. He was by this time in his 50s. The, the journey to Tibet was very difficult. He didn't speak Tibetan anyway. And he just felt he was too old for that sort of adventures. Uh, but meantime, the, the king, uh, Yishi -e, in Western Tibet, he was captured by his enemies and they put him up for ransom. So then uh, they said that he, they had to present um, the equivalent of his head weight in gold to ransom the king. So then his son uh, went around and gathered that much gold to offer. And then his father said, no, I'm old anyway. It doesn't matter about me. You take this gold that you have um, and take it to India and again uh, petition uh, Atisha to come so that, uh, and tell him that, you know, I, I have done this for, uh, in order that he should bring Dharma to Tibet. So that's what they did. Meantime, the king was beheaded because they didn't come up with the ransom. And so when Atisha, of course, heard that the king had sacrificed his life in order to um, invite him to uh, Tibet, what could he do? And likewise, his, um, his, uh, the, the deity that he was very close to, who was uh, the goddess Tara, the Buddha Tara, she also told him he should go to Tibet. So after Tibet, he went. And he had an enormous influence on Tibetan Buddhism there. Of course, it had already been introduced and established in the 8th century. But he emphasized especially the very basics of how, before we do any of these high tantric practices and all these fancy stuff, we really have to get a strong foundation in genuine compassion, and uh, being uh, taking refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha and, and really transforming our minds before we start doing all this other uh, fancy stuff. So 
his tradition uh, actually died out eventually in Tibet, but the teachings and texts from that tradition were incorporated into all the other lineages. So everybody practices that and everybody reveres uh, Palda Natisha very much for his, his tremendous help in, in establishing Tibetan Buddhism really with the emphasis on, on compassion and not on, on gaining powers which is also often happens on the tantric path it becomes a thing about becoming more powerful and the ego becoming bigger and uh, Atisha really kept people look you know it's all about non-ego and about developing qualities to benefit others not about our own self-promotion with the reason the result that Tibetan Buddhism stayed really very uh, much on the path and produced very, very great masters down to the present day. So uh, this actual text was not written by a teacher himself. It was um, written by a, a disciple of a disciple of a disciple called Langri Tangpa. But um, it coalesces into a very short form the basic ideas and uh, people such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, etc., always, as part of their practice, every morning recite these eight verses um, because it sets tone for the day. And then, when difficulties come, one can recall this verse and, and remind oneself how to respond in a skillful manner instead of just getting all upset and angry and uh, defensive. So, so he starts right off um, by thinking of all. I will read it first, um, which kind of gives. Uh, in the Tibetan tradition, um, one is not supposed to read a text until it's been read to you by someone who themselves has had that that text read to them all the way back to the author. So sometimes, even if it's, you know, 600 pages um, a thousand years ago, uh, you still have, it's like lighting the candle. You know, they, they got the match, they lit the candle, then that candle lit the flame, and so forth. So every time there's that connection back to the author themselves. So, um, of course, nowadays, especially with all these texts being translated, that's it's kind of, But still, uh, within the uh, Tibetan community, if you want to study a text, you have to go and find someone to give you this uh, oral transmission. So I will just read it quickly, and then we'll go through it verse by verse. By thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. Whenever I'm in the company of others, I will guard myself as the lowest among all, and from the depths of my heart cherish others as supreme. In my every action, I will watch my mind, and the moment destructive emotions arise, I will confront them strongly and avert them, since they will hurt both me and others. Whenever I see ill-natured beings or those overwhelmed by heavy misdeeds or suffering, I will cherish them as something rare, as though I found a priceless treasure. Whenever someone out of envy does me wrong by attacking or belittling me, I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. Even when someone I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes mistreats me very unjustly, I will view that person as a true spiritual teacher. In brief, directly or indirectly, I will offer help and happiness to all my mothers and secretly take upon myself all their hurt and suffering. I will learn to keep all these practices untainted by thoughts of the eight worldly concerns and may I recognize all things as illusions and without attachment gain freedom from bondage. So we start with verse 1. These halls never have clocks. I know, but it's hidden by a... Uh, well, they will. 
Okay, so the direction of all our good wishes, of all our compassion, of all our empathy is directed to all sentient beings. That means all conscious beings, all beings with consciousness. So that means certainly not just our own clan, our own caste, our own family, our own race, or even just all human beings. It also means all animals, all insects, beings that live in rivers and oceans, beings that live in the sky, beings that live under the earth, beings not only in this realm, but in the many other realms of beings that we can't see, the heavenly realms and the lower realms, and of course throughout the universe, because the universe obviously contains many, many beings that which we know nothing about. So all sentient beings encompasses everything which has consciousness because all, to all beings their own self is most precious, is most dear. Even an insect, you have a mosquito and the mosquito wants to have supper and splush. But you know that that insect's life is now completely gone. And yet for that insect, its own life was very precious and it was very important for that insect. It was all it had. So we should be more careful recognizing that every single being that we meet, not only all the other human beings, but also animals and insects and fish and birds, each one holds themselves most dear and doesn't want to be hurt, just as we do not want to be hurt. And so even if we cannot help them, at least we could try to be careful not to harm. That's the basis on which all of this is its base. The fact that each being holds themselves as most precious, and doesn't want to be hurt, just as we do not want anyone harming us, what being wants to be harmed? So that, as I say, is the most important foundation on which everything else follows. We're not just thinking humans, but also animals, insects, birds, fish, and so forth, all beings. So by thinking of all sentient beings, as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel for accomplishing the highest aim, I will hold them dear. Now, as you know, being Indians, a wish-fulfilling jewel was that which is this mythical jewel which, if we have it, fulfills all our wishes. So if we want endless wealth, if we want our children to come number one in the exams, if we want somebody we love to um, uh, be free from their sickness, and so forth. This wish-fulfilling jewel can fulfill all our wishes. What it cannot do is give us enlightenment. It cannot give us spiritual benefits. This wish-fulfilling jewel can only give us mundane, worldly benefits. Money, good health, beauty, but it cannot give us inner realizations. It cannot give us liberation. Who can are all these other beings, if we treat them properly, if we understand how. Therefore, they are much more precious in the long run than a mere wish-fulfilling jewel, which can only satisfy, well, it never can satisfy the endless cravings for this lifetime. But it's not going to get us awake. It's not going to help us to really inwardly transform ourselves and go beyond our ordinary 
greedy, angry, self, self-concerned, self-cherishing mind. It can't do that. But if we relate properly with all the beings around us, we can use them as our means to transform our own mind. And by transforming our own mind, we begin to wake up. And since in order to wake up, we do need other people. Therefore, other people, other beings, are more precious to us than even a, a jewel which grants all our worldly desires. So therefore, instead of seeing other people as the obstacle to our path, this is very important. Instead of thinking of other people as an obstacle to our path, we recognize that they are the path. That learning how to deal skillfully, especially with unskillful people, is how we learn and how we begin to mature and grow up and, and begin to really cultivate genuine compassion. Because, of course, it's always very easy to be friendly and loving and kind to people who are friendly, loving, and kind. Anybody can do that. It doesn't require anything. You know, if someone's nice to you, you're likely to be nice back. But the real challenge for us all is to recognize that the people who are the most difficult for us, on one level, are actually our greatest helpers on the spiritual path because they are the people who are going to help us to really challenge our own ideas about you know, how we should be treated by others and our, our very self-cherishing mind. So this whole text is dealing, as you can see, with exactly that. So therefore, by thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel for accomplishing the highest aim. The highest aim in Buddhism is to wake up, to become a Buddha. Bud means to waken. So it's not a matter of going off and going into Mahasamadhi for years and months and centuries. It's a matter of waking up, of actually resourcing our own innate wisdom, compassion, mind, so that we are able to see things how they really are and not the way that it is normally um, processed by our, our senses and our, our brain, which is very uh, egocentric. The way we live is always revolving around me, 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 me what I like, what I want, what I don't want, what is good for me. So the whole time we are thinking I, 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 I. As somebody pointed out yesterday, in the English language at least, I is the one uh, word which is always capitalized. And I mean that, of course, not in all languages is that true, but it, it says something, you know? You, them, him, her, small letters, I, <laughs> meantime. So, because we, we live our life with the I standing supreme and everything running around it, we don't see things how they really are either externally or internally. We are deluded in our thinking. So we are asleep. We are just dreaming, really, with all our deluded ideas and memories and opinions and, and so forth. So always the idea is to wake up, to finally see things with a whole different level of consciousness, of awareness, to see things how they really are. 
and that immediately demotes the I from a big capital letter right down into a very empty, spacious interconnection instead of being so solitary and um, supreme in all the world. So therefore, sentient beings, because they help us to do this, they help us to um, gather this, this inner wisdom. Therefore, they are far more precious than anything which can just uh, give us worldly desires, which just increases our greed anyway. Um, so for that reason, I will hold them dear. Meaning that every, because we rely on other beings to help us on the path, on many levels, we, even if one is living in, in isolation, one still relies on other people you know, to, to deal with supplies and, and you know, working in the fields to, make, um, to grow the crops and uh, just the, the whole internet. What to speak of uh, if you're living within a city or in a, in a society, we rely constantly on other beings because nobody can do everything. You know, even just to go and buy a, a kilo of rice, that has actually required enormous amounts of cooperation from enormous amounts of people, from the farmers, to the animals who are pulling the plows, to uh, you know the people that they're selling their seed to, to the people who are hitting the crop, and, the, and all the shopkeepers and whatever's in between. I mean, if we think about it, and plus the insects who are irrigating the soil and 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 so forth, it just is infinite. Just one thing. So we rely on other beings constantly. And so, just to survive on this planet, we need so many helpers, seen and unseen. So we should be grateful. All these people are working together in interconnection so that we can keep living. However, verse 2, Whenever I am in the company of others, I will regard myself as the lowest among all, and from the depths of my heart cherish others as supreme. So again, this has to be understood. First of all, uh, these texts were written by um, uh, important monks in their day who everybody held as being very important and were very polite to and seated on the highest seats and always treated very, very well. And so if they're not careful, they get a little bit proud, you know. And of course, before that, you know, in India, so many of these uh, high scholars, even in the Buddhist world, were Brahmins or high caste. And so they took it for granted that they were superior to everybody. Nothing much has changed. <laughs> so therefore, for them, it was very salutary to think that, uh, you know, everybody else is more important than me. But really what it is saying it doesn't really have anything to do with class or caste. What it's saying is that, in general, when we meet with others, so often it happens that people are thinking, I wonder what they think of me. And we are listening to our thoughts and our opinions of that other person. And that other person is only important insofar as what they can do for me and my opinion of them. In other words, even when we are in society with others, they are still, we are still the center of our universe. And it's our opinions of them and what we perceive as their opinions of us which count. In other words, it's all me, me, me. 
even when we're with others. And so this again creates, um, it creates a barrier because often you meet people and you can see they're not really listening to you or you're not really listening to them. You're just waiting for the time to give your opinion. Have you noticed? Uh, it's very rare to meet someone who absolutely empties out inwardly and just listens <coughs> because they are not thinking of themselves, they are not thinking of what clever response they can give, they are not judging, they are just listening and the other person is important. Themselves are not important and that's what this means. It's not about high and low as far as, you know, social status or caste or anything. It's to do with whoever we are with. At that moment, that person is the most important person in the universe for us because it's the person we are with. One, one sees that very much, for example, with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Any of you who ever met His Holiness will know what I mean. Even when um, he's walking out and, and meeting like a crowd of people and he will go to one person or another and hold their hand and look at them in the eyes, in that moment, that person, well, I mean, they feel sort of lit up. But afterwards they recognize it's because in that moment they were the only person that existed for his holiness. And he wasn't judging them. So he treats, I mean, he can treat the president of the United States the same as he'll treat one of the policemen guarding him. To him they're all the same, they're just human beings with problems and difficulties and triumphs and joys and sorrows. In that moment, only that He's looking at the person behind the facade. And so for many people it melts them and for other people, especially those who are very caught up in their facade, it's very challenging. You can often see these, these politicians beside him <laughs> looking very uptight. <laughs> you know, because they find it very challenging to be with someone who is not interested that you're the chief minister of that or you're the, the this or that. Just looking at the person behind it all, behind the mask. But with love, not with judgment, he sees the person there. And, and so that tremendous compassion comes through. Because he's not thinking, oh, I'm the Dalai Lama, I, I hope they're impressed. <laughs> you know, you can see he could care less. The only person that matters at that moment for him is the person that he's speaking to. And he speaks to them again not in a way which categorizes them, decides they're better than me, they're worse than me, they're as good as me, nothing like that. But just with an open-hearted fellowship and, and compassion. So that's what this is talking about. It's not talking about, you know, that we should all develop an inferiority complex. And, and consider ourselves to be unworthy on everybody's better than me and I'm no use or, you know, as a counterbalance to thinking I'm so special and who are these people, they have no significance. It's, it's not dealing with that. It's dealing with the fact that when we meet people at that moment, that person is the, of supreme importance. And we ourselves, therefore, step out the way. You know, and sometimes when people meet people, you can see, they're not seeing that person at all. They are like a monolith there, me. You know, and everybody else is just an extension of me. And so it's, get out the way. Let the other person shine in their own light. Why are we blocking that other person? So, 
all other people, not just people of our own social status or people that we think are attractive or important or of some benefit to us in some way, but to recognize that all beings that we meet, as I said, to each being their own self is most precious. It doesn't matter who they are in the worldly sense. And, and to respect that. Respect that each one of us is really, we have so much more in common than merely our education and our social status and our race and all these, even our gender or any of these things. That, that, that is trivial compared with what we have in common with each other. So therefore, when we meet anyone, we should have that sense of, of inner friendliness and kindness. You know, Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That sums it up. And in the Jewish, they, they turn it the other way around. In, in, in the Old Testament, it says, don't do to others what you wouldn't have them do to you. And it means all others, not just people in our own social stratosphere. Because all beings, when you look in their eyes, there they are. So this verse is a very important one to, to remember to, um, when we meet with other people, to put them at the forefront. And, and as I said, as it were, to step out of the way, step out of their light, let their light shine. And even if it's only for a moment, there is that connection. I mean, as I say, you know, sometimes people meet with people like His Holiness or others, and it's just, just for a moment, you know, it's just going by, but they look at you and smile, and sometimes it transforms their whole life. It doesn't have to be a long, you know, sessions. In that moment, there is that openness and acceptance with love. And that's what, in the end, we're all looking for, is, is to be accepted as we are and loved despite it all. So, for each of us, we can practice this. This is why sentient beings are so important for us. Because we have, you know, it's very easy to close ourselves off, especially those living in the city. They feel overwhelmed. There are just too many sentient beings out there. And so we, we tend to, um, you know, make a, a little fortress around ourselves. And, and, you know, and this is saying, don't do that. It doesn't mean that we rush out and hug everybody that we meet in the street. But it does mean that when we are meeting with anybody for any reason, then we should do so with a heart which is, is kind, and wishes the other well, and is non-judgmental, and is not thinking in terms of what are they thinking about me, or you know how am I judging them. Doesn't mean that we have to be naive, right? I mean, obviously, if we're in business, or if we're, you know, we, we don't have to just be um, in, in fantasy world about this. But even if we see somebody is not to be trusted, then we, rather than just become very negative, even though we are now cautious because we know they're trying to cheat us, for example, nonetheless, we recognizing that and thinking what it must be like to have a mind which is always trying to cheat others. How sad. So then, instead of reacting with, with anger, or we can uh, feel a sense of, of compassion for them. It doesn't mean we let ourselves be cheated. 
but we don't have to get all uptight and angry about it. We can think, well, what, what were the causes that created this person who goes around doing that sort of thing? You know, we don't know their history. So basically, it's just dealing with how to um, open up the heart to recognize that everybody we meet, really, we, we need to look at them with unprejudiced eyes and, and recognize that high or low, far or near, we as, as beings all really would rather be treated well than to be treated badly. We know that. Just as we don't want people to be mean to us, then why are we mean to others? I mean, it's obvious if we think about it. As I say, that does not mean that if we're in an abusive situation, we just allow people to get away with being abusive. But it does mean how within that can we bring a certain clarity to the situation so that we can deal with the situation skillfully instead of creating more problems and just arousing more difficulties and, and anger and so forth. I mean, as we can see, it's happening right now on, in the world in, with the politics with what happened in Paris. I mean, the, the reaction was that of, of children in kindergarten. You know, you hit me, I'll hit you harder. And then, you know, you just end up with this huge wall in which more and more kids get caught up in it. And, and in the end, you're all just fighting each other and scratching each other. And, you know, is that supposed to be a solution? Politicians are no more spiritually advanced than anybody, if even that. And it's, uh, you know, the whole world is controlled by people whose own minds are totally out of control. Hence our problems. But each one of us, from our own side, can learn to grow up and, and be more in control of the situation and, and not act like a bunch of children in kindergarten. So, in my every action, I will watch my mind, and the moment destructive emotions arise, I will confront them strongly and avert them, since they will hurt both me and others. So then, this is a very basic instruction. All of our actions, our speech, and our physical actions depend on prior intention. And intention comes from the mind. So therefore, if we have negative thoughts, we are likely to speak negatively and act negatively. Likewise, if we have wholesome thoughts, then we are likely to have um, skillful speech and, and kind actions. So the fact is that most of us, even though we live within our mind the whole time, we're always thinking, 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 thinking. But most of us are not really very conscious of what is going on in our mind and what kind of thoughts we normally dwell with. Because a lot of our attention goes out through the sense doors to what we, we're seeing and hearing and tasting and touching, smelling, etc. And then our thoughts are tumultuously running along, putting it all together making sense of our external reality, and at the same time being caught up in the past, all our memories and our ideas and our things which happened, you know, an hour ago, a day ago, a year ago, a lifetime ago, or else we're planning and hoping and fearing for the future. The one place we have a hard time dwelling is right now here. And so, even our memories, of course, are very distorted. I mean, we think we remember how things were, but if we meet someone else who was, happened to be around at that time and we say what happened, and they say, no, it wasn't like that at all. 
and they have a whole different version of what happened. Of course, they're wrong, but nonetheless, um, they're, they're mistaken memories. So we cannot even rely on what we think, and yet we believe it. Because I think this, it must be true. This is how beliefs come about, right? Because I think it. If I think it, then it's right. And we don't even question that. We don't even look. And during the day, the whole time, we are swimming in this, this ocean of thoughts, feelings, memories, anticipations. But mostly, we're not even aware of what we are thinking. And that very much influences how we relate to others, how we relate to circumstances, how what we say, and what we do. All of it comes from the mind. We, we cannot perform an action without a prior intention. Even if it's so quick, we normally don't notice it. But actually, before we say or do anything, there has to be a mental intention there for the body to respond or the vocal uh, organs to uh, formulate speech. So it's not just enough to put a guard on our physical actions and our speech as yesterday we were speaking about ethics and the ethics of not killing and stealing and being careful with our speech. But the, the prime source is our mind. And so therefore, it's very important for us to begin to observe the mind. Now, of course, there are meditations where we can just sit and look at the mind for a shorter or longer period. But especially also during the day, we should have times when we just turn the attention in. And in this moment, what am I thinking? Just look. In the, uh, the monastery, the ashram of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, they have something called a mindfulness bell. Uh, which goes ding, and then everybody stops what they're doing for just a few moments. And how is the body? What is the mind doing in this moment? Apparently, you can get that appliance on your phone. You can have a mindfulness bell on your phone. And it will, again, just go ding. And I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> Especially not in your office <laughs> or if you're cooking. But what, what one does is at that moment, one just brings one's mind back into the present. In this moment, what is one doing? Physically, verbally, but especially mentally. What is the mind doing? And then, um, when destructive emotions arise, destructive emotions are, is this translation here for the word klesha. Uh, klesha meaning something which afflicts us, which torments us. And so the clashes are those negative emotions like our greed and grasping and anger, frustration, annoyance, aversion, all that cycle. And then jealousy, envy, somebody gets something I want and so instead of feeling pleased for them, we, we feel upset and angry and why didn't that happen for me? Why is it given to them? and pride. Pride in Buddhism doesn't just mean thinking that we are better than someone else. 
it also includes thinking we're worse than someone else or that we're just as good as someone else. In other words, it's this feeling of I, again, at the center of everything, comparing ourselves endlessly with everybody else we meet. That sense that, you know, everybody else fits in in accordance with my own assessment of who I am. So therefore, I am better than that one. I'm superior, but then I meet somebody else. And now I'm, I'm inferior. Or else, you know, we're thinking, well, I'm just as good as everybody else. All of it is a clasia because it is, again, me, 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 me. So, and the underlying clasia, which is our ignorant delusion of not seeing things clearly and, and relating everything back to this sense of an I. This I which sits in the center of everything and which we somehow assume to be unchanging, solid, real, and uh, the, the ultimate center of who we are, which from a, a Buddhist percent perspective is our ultimate ignorance, that we don't see things properly. So also these texts are helping us to begin to dissolve this sense of an autonomous, solid, enduring, unchanging me at the center of everything which, if we search for it, it cannot be discovered. So, again, it's, we have to look at our mind. We, and when we see that our mind is overtaken with annoyance, aversion, upsets, or we're becoming very greedy and, and uh, caught up in all our desires and wants, or we're, we're upset because, as I say, somebody got something we wanted and why should they have it? Or any of these kind of very negative uh, anxieties and negative feelings that we have in our heart. The first thing is to recognize it. If we don't recognize it, then it will just feed on itself and increase and increase and increase and take over. So the sooner we can recognize when a negative emotion arises in the heart, the, the quicker we can deal with it. Because it's, it's uh, especially certain um, emotions, dark emotions, they're like a cancer. They just take over everything after a while. They destroy all the goodness in us. So it's very important to recognize these feelings as they come as soon as possible. So the only way we can recognize is by looking, by putting a searchlight, illuminating the mind with our observation, by watching the mind and very truthfully seeing what's going on in the hair at this moment. And if it is something negative, then to try to uproot it. First, we have to recognize it, then we have to accept it. Right now, I'm feeling angry, or right now, I'm, I'm feeling really quite greedy, or right now, I'm, I'm feeling jealous, or whatever. Whatever negative emotion we have in our mind, first, we have to recognize it, then we have to accept it. Yes, this is what I'm feeling. Not pretend I'm not feeling that. No, that's what I'm feeling. This unease inside me, what is causing this? And really look and try to find what, what, what's the cause of this feeling inside me right now. And then we have to decide what to do about it. Which, of course, again is um, uh, very much uh, part of the path how to take negative emotions and deal with them skillfully. And, and so there are so many different methods depending on our ability to deal with the mind. Some people have a lot of uh, understanding of their mind so they can very quickly avert uh, negative emotions and transform them into positive ones. 
other people because they, they don't know, they don't have control, then they're still overwhelmed uh, by their negative emotions. So then it's much more difficult just to say, right, I'm not going to be angry, I'm going to be patient and full of loving kindness, that's very nice, but I'm 